Welcome back to another episode of the Unlearning Podcast. My name is Ashley Lynn Hanks, and I am so excited to have you joining me on this unlearning journey. If you're new to the show, first of all, thank you for hitting play. The Unlearning Podcast is all about helping you gently deconstruct the toxic theology of the evangelical Christian faith in order to help you learn to love Jesus and your neighbor through healthy, life-giving theology. We're currently in the midst of a series on Christina Cleveland's amazing book, God is a Black Woman. Cleveland's womanist theology, her theology rooted in Black feminism, is so healthy and life-giving, it's really helping me to see things much clearer. If you haven't picked up a book yet, please hit the pause button right now and go get yourself a copy of Christina Cleveland's book. Allow Cleveland to shepherd you through this journey herself. It's a great way to learn from her and to support her amazing work. Before we begin, I want to address the difficult reality that there is a lot of uncertainty around reproductive issues today. The issues surrounding abortion are so complex and so challenging, especially for Christians. And so I want to make space for whatever you believe, whether you're pro-choice or pro-life. In the coming days, I'm going to publish a whole episode on the history of abortion in our country what we find in scripture on the topic, and how we might be able to respond to these issues in light of the lived experiences of women. No matter what you believe about this topic, I really want you to join me in the next episode to help you think about reproductive rights in a critical way. In last week's episode, I talked about the core theology around God being a Black woman instead of the white male God our evangelical church gave us. According to Christina Cleveland, if God is a Black woman, then God cherishes our needs, weaknesses, vulnerabilities, and fears. This is so important. If you can see God as cherishing your weakness, vulnerabilities, and fears, instead of seeing your imperfections as sin, then you can begin to have a healthy, life-giving understanding of God. For many of us, understanding God this way is super challenging. It requires a massive stretch of the imagination. Nevertheless, Cleveland encourages us to see God this way, even if we are, and I quote, constantly at war with our embodied need, end quote. We can come to God with our struggles and we can be confident she will embrace our needs. Cleveland wrote, and I quote, I could tell her my messy truth that I was barely pieced back together, that I was often at war with my embodied need. I knew I could tell God that my healing journey was fitful at best. I knew I could tell her that even after years of trauma therapy and mindfulness meditation, it still often feels like my body, emotions, and heart are miles away from my overdeveloped, overeducated, and overlinear brain. End quote. This paragraph on the tender acceptance of God as a black woman is so wonderful. It reminds me of that verse in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, where Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. End quote. Come to God, however you understand God, and trust that God cherishes your needs, vulnerabilities, fears, and weaknesses, and that you don't have to be ashamed of your own humanity. In God's eyes, your humanity is a gift. It is how God created you. Now, I want to speak to this phrase that Cleveland used in the quote I read a couple minutes earlier. In her quote, she described the tension in her inner life as, and I quote, an embodied war on her needs. Now, I totally identify with this phrase. Think about it for a minute. Is your inner life characterized by an embodied war on your need for rest, on your need for love, for connection and belonging? Or do you cherish your needs and your humanity? You see, many of us grew up with the teachings of biblical manhood and womanhood, But in biblical femininity, there is like a special sour toxicity in it. (laughs) In biblical femininity, we are taught 
that men are created for the glory of God and that women are created to support men in expressing God's glory. Men lead, women follow. More than that, we're taught in biblical femininity to dress, smell, act in such a way that our husbands will find us attractive and that they won't cheat on us or go astray. This kind of thinking puts the responsibility for fidelity upon women and upon how women use their bodies to please men. It also supports this idea that our bodies, our needs, and our wants are not our own, that we should all be in submission to our husband's desires. This is not a healthy way to live. This teaches us to detach from our own needs, vulnerabilities, fears, and weaknesses, and to constantly see them in the context of our husband's desires. I recently learned about Maribel Morgan, author of The Total Woman. The Total Woman was a book on biblical femininity that came out in the mid-70s, and it was a New York Times bestseller. Author Kristen Covey's Dumez describes Morgan's book this way, and I quote, It was God's plan for women to be under a husband's rule. But Morgan mostly drew on her own experience, particularly when it came to questions of intimacy a topic about which she had much to say. To begin with, it was important for women to keep up their curb appeal and to look and smell delicious. These are direct quotes, curb appeal and to look and smell delicious from her book. To be feminine, soft, and touchable, and not to be, and I quote, dumpy, stingy, or exhausted. Dumez wrote, to keep a husband's interest, Morgan has a strong believer in the power of costumes in the bedroom or kitchen, living room, or vac hammock, so that when a husband opened the front door each night, it was like opening a surprise package, end quote. I want you to check out this audio clip from a special broadcast where Morgan talks about her book and her ideology behind it. Do you know that your husband loves his body? He does. It's the only one he has. And he lives in there. And he wants you to love it, too. This is Maribel Morgan preaching her gospel of good marriage to the people she calls home executives, to the millions of American women who prefer Women's Day to Playgirl and who think Gloria Steinem is a disease. She sketches her basic blueprint for blessings in her book, 200 pages of tips on how to make your marriage come alive. They boil down to the four A's. Accept, admire, appreciate, and adapt to your husband in every way. Put him above all. The book was the national nonfiction bestseller in 1974. Simon & Schuster paid three quarters of a million dollars for the right to bring it out as a pocketbook. Sales are brisk. To make them brisker, Maribel herself stumps the bookstores and the television talk shows. When your husband was getting ready to go to work this morning and he was standing in front of the mirror, do you know what he saw? He saw an 18-year-old youth. That's right, even if he didn't have any hair. And maybe he had a very large tummy as he looked in the mirror and straightened his tie, he thought, you tiger you. Your husband needs you to see that same tiger in the mirror. It is only when a woman surrenders her life to her husband, reveres and worships him, and is willing to serve him, that she becomes really beautiful to him. She becomes a priceless jewel. The glory of femininity is queen. Now, I know Morgan sounds weird and strange, but the ideas behind her book are still alive and present today in evangelical femininity. There is nothing wrong with encouraging women to live into their sexuality, whatever it is. What's unhealthy is when women are encouraged to wrap their sexuality around their husband's needs and desires. It's teaching women to give in even when they don't want to. Morgan measured success in a marriage by, and I quote, whatever turns him on. Instead of living in a mutually effortful giving relationship, as Bell Hooks encouraged us to do, In biblical femininity, we are living sacrificially for the well-being and pleasure of our husbands. We sacrifice our time, our needs, our sexuality in order to force ourselves to be constantly open and available to our husbands. 
This kind of ideology is why Cleveland's book is so, so important. When God is a man, a white man for that matter, it's hard to disobey the white men in your life. When God is a man, we see the needs and wants of men as having the ultimate importance. But when God is a black woman, all of that goes away. If God is a black woman, then God cherishes our needs, vulnerabilities, fears, and weaknesses. If God is a black woman, then God calls us to freedom, not subjugation. God calls us to mental and physical liberation, not the twisting and conforming of our needs to fulfill a white man and their needs. If God is a black woman, then God understands the challenges facing women and would never call us to go against our intuition or to give when our cup is not full. Cleveland goes on to redefine healing. Cleveland wrote, and I quote, She, meaning God, doesn't promise to eradicate our need so that we can fit into white male God's concept of who is valuable. Instead, when God is a black woman, she offers to heal our relationship to our body. She reconnects our head and body so we can know how we feel and what we need and begin to ask people for what we need and to start building communities based on meeting need rather than scoffing at it, end quote. Okay, so let's pause here for a second. What does it mean to build relationships, to build friendships, families, and communities that are based on meeting needs rather than scoffing at them? What does it mean to build or to create a church that is based on meeting needs? What needs do people have? I know this is going to feel a little cynical, but many churches today, many mainline churches today, even the progressive ones, have no idea what the surrounding community actually needs. If they do care about the surrounding needs of the community, they often try to define it for themselves instead of asking the community and trusting the community to express what they need. When it comes to thinking about the precious needs of our surrounding communities, we need to take an honest look. What needs do people have in our churches? We need connection. We need the experience of belonging. We need help with parenting, how to do it in a healthy way. We need older couples mentoring younger couples, regardless if they're married. We need advocacy efforts on behalf of our poor and oppressed. We need Jesus to inspire us to forgive again. We need the hope of the gospel to help us have hope in the midst of depression, addiction, and heartache. What do I mean by the hope of the gospel? Because that phrase can be kind of triggering. When I say, when I say the hope of the gospel, I mean the hope that we have in God's love. To me, the gospel is not that Christ died for our sins. To me, the gospel is found in Romans 8, verse 38. And I quote, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. End quote. This is the hope of the gospel, the promise that nothing can separate us from the love of God. And we need to be, we need to be reminded of this hope when depression comes, when recovery is hard, and when we experience heartbreak and trauma. I believe a lot of churches and pastors are just going through the motions. They've lost their spark. And to get them back their spark, to get back their spirit, to bring back again the work of the Holy Spirit, we need to develop relationships and families and communities that are about meeting needs and not ignoring them or shaming people for have them. A healthy family is centered around the needs of a child. The child is not taking care of the parents. In a healthy church, the church is centered around the needs of the congregation. The congregation is not taking care of the pastor and the leadership team. Lots of toxic churches are rooted and surrounded by or centered upon fulfilling the needs and desires of their senior pastor and not the other way around. And so how can we learn about the needs of our surrounding community and provide for them? Again, a healthy home 
is when a home is structured around the needs of a child. And a healthy church is when a church is structured around the needs of the community and the congregation. How can you be part of creating a community, religious or not, religious or not? How can you be part of creating a community that is about meeting the needs of others? How can you be part of creating relationships that are about meeting needs and not ignoring them? These are the kinds of questions we should be asking. Relationships, families, and communities based on mutuality, not hierarchy. That's what we should be pursuing. I want to show up to church not only to serve others, but to be served by them. I want to show up to my friend group not just to get my social needs met, but with the intention of nurturing the needs of my friends. So how can you create relationships and communities based on mutuality and not hierarchy? When it comes to dealing with our embodied war with our human needs, we need to understand that God cherishes our humanity over our performance. Cleveland explains that one of the biggest lies of the evangelical culture is that, and I quote, in order to receive good things from God, like a good marriage, you must demonstrate your goodness by performing pious acts like praying and fasting, end quote. I would add devotional time, tithing, and submission to authority to Cleveland's list of pious acts. It's as if the more a person approximates white male God's whiteness, this is from Cleveland, the more a person approximates white male God's whiteness and maleness, the more desirable they are perceived to be. End quote. There is no people group that is this kind where this kind of theology doesn't hurt them more than it does Black women. You don't have to be super progressive to believe that there is an outright cultural war, systemic war on Black women and their bodies. I know that sounds so weird and even slightly evangelical, but it's so true. Our culture shames Black women for being too thick and too Black. Cleveland explains, and I quote, from the outset, Black female beauty was reduced to two things. It, one, it was inferior to white female beauty, and two, it was only acknowledged if it titillated white men. The unattainable European standards of beauty were never about human connection. Rather, they, rather they were about human domination. In such a patriarchal society, white men define and use the standards of beauty to justify their control over women. End quote. Think about this for a second. If men can get you to believe that your period is disgusting, then they can get you to purchase lots of feminine products. If men can get you to believe that your body is too big, too thick, too dark, then they can create a whole industry around diet culture and plastic surgery. If men can get you to believe the absolute lie that white beauty is the highest standard of feminine beauty, then women will never be content and satisfied with who they are. And the financial exploitation is endless. Understanding God as a Black woman destroys this kind of thinking. When we see God as a Black woman, it destroys the white male God's toxic beauty shame game. Cleveland wrote, and I quote, Black women are undeniably worthy of universal gorgeousness. No matter our skin, we radiate. No matter our size, our bodies sing. No matter our hair texture, we are works of art. No matter the direction our side eye ushers other mortals. Our beauty is more than skin deep. It peaks of our exquisite goodness and our inherent value. End quote. I wonder if you see Black women in this way, through such an affirming, life giving lens. It's also important to ask do you see yourself this way? It's hard to see the sacredness in others if we cannot identify it in ourselves. Cleveland goes on to explain how patriarchy and the white male God's toxic understanding of beauty hurts women. She wrote, and I quote, since we can never be truly beautiful, we can never be truly good, end quote. It's really sad that we live in a time when our religion emphasizes these kinds of things instead of actively deconstructing it. I'm also so grateful that Cleveland is here during our time in history, because she's leading the way in liberating us from these toxic chains. In efforts to be free, Cleveland had to change her belief system about her body and her blackness. She wrote many affirmations to provide for herself a liberating mindset. Cleveland wrote, 
I am worthy of a higher power who loves my blackness. I am worthy of a higher power who listens to, values, and validates my experiences as a black woman. I am worthy of a higher power who is fiercely nurturing. I am worthy of a higher power who is engaging and relatable. I am worthy of a higher power who is a giver of joy. I am worthy of a higher power who demands nothing from me, yet freely offers every spiritual treasure to me. I am worthy of a higher power who embraces my emotions no matter how loud they are. I am worthy of a higher power who honors my process no matter how messy it may seem. I am worthy of a higher power who loves all my body sizes. I am worthy of a higher power who rejoices in my imperfections. I believe these are wonderful affirmations that we should all try to believe about our higher power. One thing that Cleveland mentioned that really has just stuck with me since I read it is that she no longer calls God her higher power as we do in recovery programs. She now, because that, emphasizes the hierarchy of God. And love, real love, healthy love is rooted in mutuality and not in hierarchy. That's not to say that we can't love God for being divine and greater than us, but she says a better way to understand God is your deeper power. I am worthy of a deeper power who honors my process. I am worthy of a deeper power who loves all my body sizes. Understanding God as a deeper power is really healthy because it's less about parent-child and more about God being everywhere, present in all things, even within us. Anyway, please use whatever works for you. I just wanted to share that because that was big for me. Now, I know today's episode is a lot to take in, so I'm just going to stop there. (laughs) But I'm so glad that you listened to the end. I want to leave you with a homework assignment, okay? In her book, Cleveland wrote about how she began to believe that her body was not an enemy to be subdued and colonized. She wrote, and I quote, I began to let go of an ideal body size and instead slowly built peace with my body. I began each day by getting out of the shower and compassionately examining my naked body in the full length mirror and reminding myself that my body was my best friend. Unlike the white male God, my body never rejected me, never gave up on me, starved me, broke up with me or threatened me. Despite all that the white male God had done to it, my body was still doing its absolute best to keep me alive. I cultivated compassion for my body by each day focusing on one part of my body and verbally thanking it for being on my side and working to keep me alive despite it all. End quote. Next time you get out of the shower, take a long look at your body. Remind yourself that your body is your best friend. Your body never rejected you never gave up on you, starved you, broke up with you or threatened you. Your body has always been there for you, getting you up each day and helping you through. I know that loving our bodies can be a lot harder than simply calling it our best friend and that we all have different relationships with our bodies based on our physical abilities. But I still want to encourage you to do this and to have a positive life-giving understanding of your body. It is where our embodied soul lives and your body is more precious than anything you own or could possibly possess. As Cleveland said, we can cultivate compassion for our bodies each day by focusing on one part of our body and verbally thanking it for being on our side, working to keep us alive despite it all. Thank you so much for joining me on today's episode. I hope this topic and this series has been a blessing to you and that it gives you a lot to think about. Until next time, my name is Ashley Lynn Hangst, and you are listening to the Unlearned Podcast.